Thank you very much for the invitation to SIGA for the initiative of uh, taking care of topics that these days uh, very few institutions uh, are following up and have the courage to really discuss in depth um, and try to disentangle the puzzle and the atrocities at the same time that have been committed in the name of the war on terror. Um, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Sami for his initiative uh, as director of SIGA. Um, and we'd like to thank you uh, to all of you uh, for being there and for the and also say hello to the audiences that are listening to this event. Uh, the topic I would like to cover is precisely the try to go over the geopolitics of war on terror. Um, I would like to begin with um, two major transformations after Second World War. Uh, and I would like to begin with two concepts. The first concept is a concept that was coined by Kwame Kruma, the famous Pan-Africanist, who after Second World War, he was the leader of the Ghana Revolution uh, that brought the first independent country in Africa um, after the mid 20th century and who became the leader of the National Liberation Movement, not only in Ghana, but in Africa at large. And out of his own experience, he coined a concept that today we, um, is, is, a, is a common concept used in many uh, parts of the world, which is the concept of neo-colonialism, the concept of new forms of colonialism after the end of colonial administrations how the empires uh, did not uh, stop doing uh, or practicing colonial domination after the demise of the colonial administration, but instead they developed new methods, new forms uh, of colonialism, of keep the, the colonial control over the periphery of the world economy. And Kwame Kruma was talking about this uh, out of his own experience, he was the president of Ghana and he was himself uh, overthrown by a CIA coup d'etat in the mid-60s uh, that took him to exile. Um, I would like also to, to mention a second concept uh, that is uh, very important too, uh, that is less known because it's by a leader, a, an anti-imperialist leader in the Dominican Republic, an island in the Caribbean uh, that have a, a border with Haiti. Um, and his name is Juan Bosch. Juan Bosch was president of the Dominican Republic um, from late 62 until uh, after mid uh, 63. He was himself, like Kwame Kruma, toppled by also a CIA coup d'etat. Um, and he coined the term pentagonism. And both Kwame Kruma and Juan Bosch uh, wrote uh, books on this topic. The title of Kwame Kruma's book is Neocolonialism. Uh, the last stage of imperialism. And Juan Bosch uh, wrote a book entitled Pentagonism, Substitute of Imperialism. Uh, pentagonism, he refers to a, he says that pentagonism is a new phenomenon after Second World War that continues the same characteristics of imperialism, but with a major transformation, which is that 
pentagonism is when uh, when the military industrial complex of the USA uh, fabricate wars of aggression, not so much because they are in the old times of imperialism and colonialism looking for necessarily resources, although they do that in, so, in many of their interventions, but because it's a way for the military industrial complex of the USA to uh, capitalize very fast, very rapidly, accumulate a lot of capital accumulation through uh, state resources. That is the military industrial complex. Uh, when there is a war, uh, they get uh, purchases from the US government in the millions, if not billions of dollars. Um, and Juan Bosch analyzed the Vietnam War. This is a book, uh, both of these books were published in the mid 60s the Kwame Kruma book on neocolonialism and the Juan Bosch book on pentagonism. So pen pentagonism is saying everything Kwame Kruma describes as these new forms of colonialism, that economic exploitation, economic domination over the countries that became formally independent creates a new form of colonialism where now you don't need the colonial administration to keep doing uh, col you know, colonial domination. Uh, but it's done through new means, new methods. That's why he coined, coined the term neocolonialism. And he lived it himself as president of Ghana. He saw the mechanism used by the imperialist system to keep dominating Ghana from economic exploitation all the way to, to a coup d'etat to a government they didn't like, like his own government, and being kicked out of the country. Uh, and... In the case of Juan, Juan Bosch, who experienced the same thing, he's saying all these things of the old imperialism is there, but there is something new happening, which is that now the military industrial complex is using the resources of the metropolitan population, okay, which is the taxpayers of the imperial state, as resources for uh, getting a mass accumulation of capital uh, by making the state the main buyers uh, or, you know, of the military uh, uh, industrial complex, such as airplanes, uh, weapons, bombs. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a long list of industries that are tied to the military industrial complex, including uh, you know, producers of coffee machines uh, that are in naval ships or in Air Force airplanes and or in trucks uh, of the army and so on, you know. And, and so what happened here is that uh, they're not so much interested in the old ways of exploiting economically a country, but they're more interested in perpetuating warfare in third world countries as a way of keeping the US Defense Department budget growing and keeping the purchases over the industry uh, uh, moving forward. And this is important to keep in mind, okay, because um, this combination of neocolonialism with pentagonism, I think, uh, gives us some conceptual tools to uh, make sense of war on terror. Uh, so let me back off a little. In the After 1945, we have the Cold War. I mean, we have the um, basically the main enemy for the US empire was the Soviet Union, and the military industrial complex was focused on the anti-communist uh, uh, propaganda and the anti-communist warfare, and they were building all kind of uh, military equipment, etc., in relation to this, you know, Cold War against the Soviet Union, that became a hot war in the periphery of the world economy. That is, a lot of the war with the Soviet Union was not done against the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union and the 
and the USA were not fighting themselves. They were fighting indirectly through third world countries. So you have the Korean War, and then later you have the Vietnam War, okay? And, and, and then you have the, the war in Afghanistan, uh, and so on. And, and these are wars that, um, long-lasting wars that, in many ways, the U.S. empire knew they were not necessarily going to win them, but uh, there was this um, a machine of the military-industrial complex pushing forward for this kind of wars because that's a way of capitalizing and justifying uh, the transfer of taxpayers' money to their uh, bank accounts. Through what? Through the U.S. Imperial State purchasing uh, uh, weapons uh, in the name of being of fighting a war somewhere else, okay? So, um, while the Cold War was going on, you have a huge increase in the military industrial budget. If you remember the last day of General Eisenhower in the White House in, uh, in January 1961, before Kennedy took over, uh, it was a moment of like, uh, the old man, you know, trying to come up with a sincere message to the American public because this is the, after eight years of General Eisenhower, Cold War, CIA coup d'etat in Guatemala, CIA coup d'etat in Iran, uh, all kind of, uh, you know, the Korean War, I mean, you name it, all the, all the atrocities that happened during the 1950s under the Eisenhower administration, uh, he kind of sincere himself the last day in office and he said something like, and you can see the message in YouTube if you're interested. He said something like a, a message to American public saying, beware of the military industrial complex. And this is General Eisenhower, who knew from inside how the whole machine of militarism in the USA and pentagonism, like Juan Bosch will, will coin it, uh, uh, he knew it from inside very well. He was a general of the U.S. Army, a hero of Second World War, and at the same time became president right there in the middle of the Cold War um, in the 1950s. And he was basically in charge of the U.S. Empire. And last day, he sincerely himself with the American public and said, beware of the military industrial complex. It could destroy uh, everything in America, from the economy to the political institution to the democratic institutions, you name it. You know, so... It was like a call of attention, you know, to the American people of the dangers of military industrial conflict. That, in that message of Eisenhower, uh, I mean, this guy knew what he was talking about when he said that. But in, in a sense, it, his, his prophecy of what could happen, happened. That is, is already a, a reality in the USA. The military industrial complex right now uh, uh, basically consumes around 50, more than 50% of the budget of the federal government, okay? Now, to understand the war on terror, we need to, to go over this uh, geopolitical context, okay, to make sense of what's going on, or why the war on terror happened, and why the target were the Muslims, are, are still Muslims. And, uh, and where is the Islamophobia coming from? What is the, the agenda, okay? And what happened was that while the Cold War was going on, the military industrial complex had an, a good excuse to, to, to keep pushing for um, increasing the, the U.S. Defense Department budget. And, uh, and while this was moving on, and while the USA was involved in wars, you know, uh, you know, er, almost every year involved in a war, um, over the Cold War years, they were involved in wars uh, uh, in many parts of the world. Um, while this was going on, it was very easy to justify to keep the military, you know, the, the Defense Department budget uh, increasing, uh, and for people not to dare to 
question the idea or to or to or to throw down the idea there in the Congress, in the uh, plenary of the Congress. Like, well, why don't we cut the the expenses in the military in you know in the Defense Department and transfer these resources for other things that are needed by the people, you know? And but this uh, the lobby of the military industrial complex in Washington is so huge. That is a win-win situation for them. They put money in the electoral candidates in Congress, both Democrats and Republicans. So they never lost. I mean, they're always... Imagine how powerful it is that nobody dares in the floor of the Congress to, in the in, in the moments of the huge deficits of U.S. government, now in the trillions of dollars, before in the billions of dollars, nobody dared to... To put the question, why don't we cut the resource, you know, the, the budget of Defense Department to pay some of these debts or or for educational needs or health needs of the population, whatever, you know? Uh, nobody dares to even raise it as an idea or, or as a question in the floor of the Congress. That's how powerful it is. It's so powerful that it's like it's a non issue that the budget of the Defense Department should keep growing. Okay, and should keep, uh, you know, increasing and um, and if there's no war, they invent the war because they need wars to keep justifying this. Okay, so when the Soviet Union basically imploded in 1991 for many reasons, I I don't have the time to develop here. Uh, it imploded, then suddenly the uh, U.S. Empire and especially the the military industrial complex of the USA, which is a very powerful um, economic, political, military power base of the US empire, uh, suddenly they lost the justification of the enemy. That is, the enemy is not there anymore. So uh, what's the point of keeping a defense department budget growing and so huge and it was a moment where they were afraid someone could come up and say, hey, why don't we cut this in half for other needs? Um, and they they became, in a sense, they went into panic about this because they have no enemy to justify to keep the budget uh, growing, you know, in Defense Department. Because as you know, all this budget ends up in contracts for the military industrial complex, all these industries that are like, uh, corporate welfare, you know, they have corporate welfare. Really, the state is the one subsidizing these companies because these companies cannot just go to a to a to a shopping mall to sell these weapons. They they these are too expensive, and um, and therefore the only way they can make money is by selling it to governments, especially U.S. government, uh, and um, so. Um, the, the the next thing that happened once the demise of Soviet Union in 1991 was a debate inside the Pentagon that became a public debate in the U.S. about who is the, the enemy, who is the new enemy. They needed very rapidly to find an enemy. And there was, in the early 90s, uh, a funny debate because the Air Force was saying the enemy is China because, of course, in a war against China, the Air Force will have the upper hand, and therefore they they will have a, a bigger piece of the pie, okay, in terms of Defense Department budget. And then came the Navy. I said, no, no, the, the enemy is the drug cartels bringing drugs through the oceans to the shores of the USA, Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. So here the naval, you know, the, the Marines, the, the, the Navy will have the, the upper hand in the budget. And then came the, um, the, the another uh, uh, enemy that was being discussed there, which was that coming now from the army, that the main enemy were the uh, migrants and the cartels and drugs crossing the border between Mexico and USA. And so there was this debate going on in the early 90s about who is the new enemy. And the problem was that the three main fractions or factions of the Pentagon, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, they couldn't agree on this. They, they were fighting each other because depending on who was the enemy, uh, one of these branches would get more money than the other. You know, and so they were 
fighting about this, uh, trying to get the the you know the, the most they could you know from the U.S. Uh, budget, and and then uh, this fight went on for several years until the famous article uh, of a professor from Harvard uh, who came and said, "Hey, calm down. I have the solution here." Uh, and I have a solution where we will have an enemy where everybody here will be happy because everybody will have a role here. And that was the famous article, uh, first an article, later a book, by professor from Harvard, uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, who has a career in the USA for many years of a conservative thinker back in the 70s, trilateral commission, multinationals, and a U.S. Uh, is a think tank of multinational and U.S. empire. He was one of the leading figures back in the 70s, one of those who will justify any atrocity in the name of the interests of USA, um, who will justify uh, keeping authoritarian regimes in the third world and so on. Um, People that you know that were involved also in the coup d'état in Chile, in many coup d'états around the world, uh, and and this guy came up and say, hey, the solution is this one: clash of civilization. And while we're now that the Cold War is over, and we don't have that enemy, we invent a new enemy, and now the new enemy are the Muslims. Okay, and so he's going to call it a clash of civilizations. Uh, and uh, this clash of civilization is going to, in a sense, come up with uh, uh, the construction of a new enemy that will justify, uh, in you know, the, the increase in the in the, you know, what what Juan Bosch describes pentagonism. You know how for this uh, military-industrial complex to capitalize even more. I mean, if you look at the last. Uh, uh, 30 years, you could see how the military b budget of USA, the Defense Department, has multiplied, has escalated, okay? Because then in the name of war on terror, then they, they in, in many ways, invented this new enemy, and in the name of this, they went and invaded many countries, and um, and um, the in those destroy these countries. That's what really happened. They destroy these countries, um, and what was happening is that they, through these wars, uh, in the name of, of you know uh, the war against terror and that kind of thing, then uh, of they they went to Iraq or they went to Afghanistan or they went to and then Syria later and then Libya and then I mean and so on. And you have all this military intervention destroying countries, basically destroying the country. So you could see that there was not even an attempt at controlling in the old fashion of imperialism, in a, in a colonial or neocolonial way, this country. It was more like a devastation. And um, to keep, to take the main resources and let the rest of the country fall apart. Okay, so they, they were not even trying to, to, to practice the, the old forms of colonialism or having a colonial administration, put some order, etc. It was it's, it's chaos. They're using chaos in these countries, destroying the countries, leaving them into an eternal, perpetual civil war and warfare um, in order to then... Uh, capitalized by keep justifying the transfer of resources from taxpayers' money into the military industrial complex. So you have not millions, not billions, you have trillions with a T, trillions of dollars now transfer okay, to the military industrial complex. And of course, Islamophobia here, if in the Cold War, the, the discord was anti-communism, was the, the, the ideology used to mobilize uh, the, pop, the public opinion uh, and to, com to persuade the public opinion and the politician, the people of 
the need to increase the military uh, budget of the USA, the Defense Department, and and intervene in many countries militarily to you know basically keep justifying the the increase in the budget. Uh, now in this post Cold War era, the 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 main discourse is going to be not anti-communism but Islamophobia. And Islamophobia is going to be the main ideological tool that is going to be mobilized uh, in order to justify all these things, you know. And and of course the complicity of US Empire with some of these uh, um, takfiri groups and you know some of these Islamic terrorist groups goes back to the war of Afghanistan in Afghanistan, you know. And um, and you could see the, the the complicity of USA in the fabrication of of this group in alliance with the Saudis, Saudi Arabia, who provide the ideological tool of certain versions of Wahhabism that becomes, uh, in a sense, the ideological tool for the Takfiris, uh, and and then you have. Of course, the, the Zionist agenda here, that for the Zionists, um, it becomes a, a very important uh, element to destabilize countries around the region that they perceive as a threat to their interests, you know. And so, uh, and then they go after these countries, you know, or governments that, uh, in a sense, uh, with all these problems, with all the critiques we can make to some of these uh, uh, leaders such as Saddam Hussein, uh, Gaddafi, or Assad, etc., uh, they've been, in a sense, uh, you know, over the years, uh, in, in, with conflicts with the, with the Israelis. And, and for the Israelis, the agenda is to destabilize the whole Middle East and to try to keep a, a full control over the region, and so there are, uh, in a sense, uh, there is an alliance here of interest between the Saudis, the Zionists, and the, the U.S. Empire in this uh, post Cold War era of uh, war on terror and uh, Islamophobia uh, as the main ideology. Uh, so Islamophobia is the what is to war on terror what anti-communism was to the Cold War, okay? And um, so over the the years now, you know, uh, we have war on terror. We have now 20 years of war on terror. Um, we could see how this has weakened over time the U.S. Empire, because the U.S. Empire have entered into a kind of labyrinth of, without any exit, okay, of a depths, huge depths of the federal government. Uh, and these depths are not only deficits that have to do with um, uh, the federal government not being able to pay its accounts, you know, because it's, it's they are in a structural deficit, USA is not anymore getting the incomes it used to have in the past, but also is the drain of resources and money that all these wars have created, that have, in a sense, transferred trillions of dollars uh, in, in, in resources, in money, uh, in capital, to all these military industrial companies making billions of dollars in, in profits every year. Okay, while the uh, population is being impoverished, while the country is going, you know, basically becoming weakened because the, the federal government has now $28 trillion in trillion with a T in, in deficits, it's the most indebted country in the world. And, and then, you know, uh, this is creating now a situation that is inside the USA is creating all these contradictions uh, that is making its, uh, in a sense, um, effectiveness, uh, having lost all these wars in the Middle East, 
you know, uh, in, in South Asia, uh, having lost the wars and going nowhere there, I mean, in a sense, the question for them is not, uh, for the military industrial complex, it's not anymore winning a war, or it's not anymore the long-term interest of the U.S. empire. For these industries is how can I make a profit tonight, okay, without having any concern about the future of U.S. empire or U.S. economy or anything like this. So they, are, they just want a war tonight. And whoever produces a war for them, they are happy. That's why they're so happy with the Zionists. That's why, why, why they're so happy with Saudi Arabia, because these people are fabricating war after war. And for the military-industrial complex, it's, it's, it's great for them to have these allies that are delivering wars where they can make more money and where they can come back to the U.S. government to pass the bill and say, we need more money to keep producing more weapons, more bombs, more airplanes, more whatever, okay, more tanks. And, <clears throat> and so we need to, when we talk about Islamophobia today, we need to, in a sense, stop seeing this as a religious issue, okay? It has nothing to do with religion. It's not a lack of understanding of the empire about Islam or a lack of understanding of the West about Islam. It's not about that. It's about imperialist, a fraction of the U.S. empire's interest. In this case, the military industrial complex that is a very powerful a, a power base of the U.S. empire. And that uh, they look how they have, they don't care if you're a Muslim or not. They have allies that call themselves Muslim, okay? As long as they go along with their policies, they don't care if you're a Muslim or, or not. They're mobilizing Islamophobia as a way to justify a war on terror because they, through Islamophobia, then they create in the public opinion of the West that for them is a strategic because these are the populations that are going to consent to increases in military uh, budget and so on uh, and going along with these military adventures. Uh, so they're going to, for public consumption in the public, in the, uh, among the population of the West, they're going to uh, uh, fabricate this Islamophobia uh, 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 hysteria, okay? to uh, create, a, a, in a sense, a, a public psychosis or a public uh, a hysteria to uh, demand or consent to the uh, military adventures and to the expropriation of resources from the population and transferring all of them in, in the trillions of dollars to defense department and military industrial complex. To consent to this, Islamophobia, Islamic terrorism, war on terror, all this stuff comes in, okay? Um, and of course, uh, they're going to use some of the actions of this group that they themselves have created, okay? And I don't wanna go in detail now about that because it will take a long time, but we remember Hillary Clinton in U.S. Congress like 10 years ago when she was saying, aren't we doing now with the, you know, um, Islamic terrorists in Syria, what we did in Afghanistan, that like we were giving them all these resources, supporting them, etc. And then, you know, suddenly we are empowering uh, all these crazy groups. And she came out in public to say that before she was the... Secretary of State of the USA, uh, right there in, in U.S. Congress when she was a senator of the, in the U.S. Uh, Senate. And, and she came out to say, to ask this question. There's a video on YouTube where you can see her saying this, which shows you that they're very much aware that all these different so-called terrorist groups that, that have been fabricated by the West uh, all these groups have been, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, supported, financed, and armed with military weapons by the U.S. Empire. And how they, they've been doing this all along since the 
war in Afghanistan all the way till today, including Syria, including Iraq, including all these places where they have encouraged and supported and even transferred resources uh, in terms of money and weapons to these terrorist groups. And we know, and it's not, it's not a secret, that the complicity of the Zionists with some of these terrorist groups in the war in Syria. And, and this, is, this is not something that is not hidden in the press in Israel. Uh, you could see in Israel in the, publicly where you have Netanyahu going to hospitals in the Golan Heights, you know, where they are treating the takfiris that are injured in the war. They're treated in hospitals in the Golan Heights. Or the reports of UN of, uh, you know, officials saying that Israelis are meeting, Israeli army leaders are meeting right there in the border with Syria, uh, having meetings and having collaboration with the, some of these takfiri groups. And every time the the Syrian army comes closer, whatever, they go and bomb the Syrian army and uh, while protecting these takfiris in the border uh, and so on. So there are all these complicities that are very obvious. Uh, and between, you know, and it's a triple alliance between the USA, Israel, and the Saudis. But what has happened lately is that they have lost the wars. They have lost the war in Iraq. They lost the war in Syria. And uh, and they're, in a sense, they're losing the war in Afghanistan. And, and in Yemen, this uh, genocide that is going on right now in Yemen, they're going to lose that war too. I mean, they haven't been able, with all the genocide, all the atrocities that they're doing, they haven't been able to control the country. Still, the country is, is pretty much controlled by the uh, people of Yemen and, and the different you know, groups that are in resistance against the aggression of the Saudis in, uh, in collaboration with the, with the Zionists and, and the U.S. empire. And so uh, they're losing the wars in uh, going nowhere, but from the logic of military industrial complex, they don't care if the war is lost or not. What they care is there is a war going. So if there is no war, they fabricate a war. If they lost a war, then they find a way to, to create a new one. You know? So we need to pay attention to this because, uh, in a sense, the war on terror now, as a rhetoric, has been exhausted uh, to the point that now, uh, having lost the wars in the Middle East, U.S. empire, now, uh, in a sense, they are in a, in a situation where um, the rhetoric of war on terror is becoming more and more weakened and less people uh, taking it seriously among the public opinion, given the crisis going on, internal crisis uh, inside the U.S. empire. And therefore, they're entering now a terrain of contradiction and a terrain of problems. Uh, especially with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, US, in 2020, U.S. empire, uh, in a sense, went into a huge crisis, a great depression. We are now in a great depression. This is not a recession. It's a world great recession with the USA as its epicenter. Also, USA as the epicenter of the pandemic with largest number of people uh, passing away and largest number of people uh, sick in the world. Uh, and USA has uh, invested uh, $4 trillion uh, into transferring resources to the 1%, if you remember, a year ago uh, during the crisis of COVID-19. So they were basically bailing out like they did in, 2000, in the crisis financial crisis 2008 and 9, they bail out Wall Street, they bail out the 1%, they bail out the, the banks and the corporations. And that's what they did again in the COVID-19 crisis where they transferred $4 trillion with a T uh, to the 1%. So we're talking about uh, the, the increase in the deficit of US empire has become huge. And in the middle of this crisis, uh, USA have become now, uh, have gone down to become the second economy after China. The rise of China has, is here now with a force. 
And China now has is the number one economy in the world right now. And, and USA is, in a sense, a declining empire. And, um, and therefore, the scenario for the next decade is we're talking about a decline of U.S. empire with, um, in a sense, the, um, the rise or an or a f- internal fight that could turn into a civil war between two forms of white supremacy that I don't have the time to discuss here. One is the multicultural liberal form of white supremacy, which is the one represented by Biden and the Democrats, or certain sector of the Democrats, and the uh, form of white supremacy of uh, going back to the good old days, quote unquote, of let's make white America great again, you know, and go back to the old forms of apartheid uh, represented by Trump. And, and this division is not a Republican Democratic division. It's really, there are people inside the Democratic Party that, that are, a, in a sense, on the side of Trump in terms of the vision for the future, of going back to the, let's make white America great again. And there are people uh, on the side of the Republicans that would like to follow the you know, multicultural liberal model where you do white supremacy with a black face or a brown face, and but still white supremacy. You cover it up. And what happened with the liberal multicultural is that, in a sense, uh, they, they, are, they create a, an illusion of, um, of uh, as if there was no racism in America, as if this is, uh, and they create an illusion in the population where in a sense, the, the old form of the Trump type of white supremacy create a lot of conflicts inside the empire. And so, in a sense, Biden comes trying to create, a, to bring peace, internal peace to the empire so that they can be able to, to move internationally in a, in a more stronger way. But the problem they're having is that now all these white supremacy militias, etc., that the Trump administration took out of the closet, they're not going back to the closet. These people are there, they're out, and you saw the, the, the uprising in US Congress in January 6th, what happened there. And, uh, and these people are there, and therefore we're, we're seeing a situation where the decline of US empire could be ugly, uh, and there is a high possibility of a civil war. And in terms of the consequences of all of this for war on terror is that now there are many people in the USA that are realizing that the main terrorist problem had nothing to do with Muslim or anything like that. It has to do with the white supremacist militias in the USA. And now this is challenging the, the war on terror narrative in a very strong way. So I'm mentioning this because in a sense what we're seeing these days is the crisis of the war on terror, the decline, the, the consequences of 20 years of war on terror, throwing resources to military industrial complex and increasing the U.S. deficits and destroying the U.S. economy, basically. And, uh, and, and now the U.S. empire being in a very weak position and becoming a secondary declining power in the world. And now what you have in the next years is the struggle inside the empire in terms of uh, the different uh, solutions to the decline, how to deal with this decline. How can you, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, cope with this? And that's where there is a danger of a civil war in the USA, big time. Uh, within the next five to 10 years, it's a big danger that this could escalate into an internal civil war. And that will be, the, in many ways, the end of U.S. empire. A big civil war inside USA is like the end of U.S. empire. But I will stop here and uh, open for discussion. Thank you very much.